محمد حسن الشهاري أستاذ مساعد في قسم الجراحة جامعة صنعاء نائب رئيس قسم الجراحة في مستشفى الثورة نائب رئيس جمعية الجراحين أو جمعية الجراحين الدولية أو جمعية جراحة الكبد والبنكرياس والقنوات المرارية Today we will speak about an important and serious topic in the surgical emergency in stainal obstruction. First of all, uh, we will speak about the definition of the intestinal obstruction. Intestinal obstruction is sudden, or we can say it's an arrest of the propulsive movement of the gastrointestinal uh, tract, either at the level of small bowel or large bowel. Uh, intestinal obstruction is considered to be one of the most common surgical emergency uh, emergencies uh, in the, uh, that uh, can be faced uh, during the duties of Intestinal obstruction uh, uh, is a large topic, but we will speak exactly about the approach to the intestinal obstruction patient. Suppose you receive the patient with intestinal obstruction. Now you are in the ER. What are you going to do? First of all, you have to confirm the diagnosis of intestinal obstruction in the form of the cardinal features of the intestinal obstruction. What are the cardinal features of intestinal obstruction? The patient generally will be presented with the abdominal pain, which is usually colicky in nature and associated with abdominal distension and vomiting with absolute constipation. Absolute constipation, it means no stool or flatus. The meaning of absolute constipation is obstipation, also we can say that. This is the cardinal feature of the intestinal obstruction. First of all, once you receive the patient, you should take a proper history and do a proper examination. Why? The idea is to identify what could be the possible cause of the intestinal obstruction first. Second, to evaluate the extent or the complication or the exact situation of the patient of intestinal obstruction. I mean, is it complicated or non-complicated intestinal obstruction? So, now, we are in the emergency department. I have a patient with intestinal obstruction and I uh, take a proper, uh, history, I will take a proper history and examination. The idea of that, as I mentioned, for to, to identify the possible cause for that and to identify the level or the extension of the disease, is it complicated or not complicated? The history and examination for a patient with intestinal obstruction, a little bit we will speak about it in later in another uh, time, but I'm considering now the, the, the approach for this patient. Now, the patient has an abdominal pain, abdominal distension, and absolute constipation and vomiting. How can I proceed? First, I will deal with patient with intestinal obstruction as an emergency case. So I have to take care about airway, breathing, circulation. Sometimes patient with intestinal obstruction will be presented late. So he has a disturbed level of consciousness, secondary for surfaces, for example, for hypovolemic shock. So I have some time to secure the airway. This is first. Sometimes the patient will present it generally stable, so airway is a patent, nothing to be done. B. Breathing. The patient with intestinal obstruction usually tachypneic dysnic. Why? It's a part of systemic inflammatory response, sometimes part of sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock. This huge abdominal distension, sometimes the patient will present with that, making compression of the diaphragm. So I have to give the patient oxygen. If the patient intubated, so to be connected with the proper way of ventilation. Circulation. The patient sometimes presented with shock, either hypovolemic shock or sometimes septic shock. So I have to check the pulse and if the patient is hypovolemic or low blood pressure, I have to put two large IV port cannula and to start fluid resuscitation. Now, after these maneuvers as a life-threatening condition should be evaluated and uh, treated well, I should categorize the patient with intestinal obstruction. First approach, the patient in peritonitis or not. The patient has manifestation of bowel compromise or not. If the patient has peritonitis or manifestation of bowel compromise, 
prepare the patient for OT for exploration. First, what is peritonitis? Peritonitis is a manifestation of peritoneal inflammation manifested clinically with abdominal pain, severe abdominal pain. The patient complaining of tenderness, rebound tenderness, and guarding or rigidity. This is the clinical manifestation of peritonitis. So once presented in a patient with intestinal obstruction, take him for OT after proper resuscitation and evaluation. If the patient has manifestation of bowel compromise, I, as I mentioned, for OT. But what is the manifestation of bowel compromise? Generally, it is abbreviated in our word fatal. What's the meaning of fatal? It's being lethal. Fatal, it's abbreviation for F, fever. A, abdominal pain, persistent abdominal pain. Uh, T, tenderness, I mean localized tenderness with tachycardia. A, acidosis, manifested by increased lactate level or AVG. L, leukocytosis. A presence of three of those features suggest of power compromise. That's mean, what I mean by power compromise, the vascularity of the power are compromised. Maybe there's manifestation of power ischemia at the level of obstruction, at the level of the obstruction. So I should take the patient for OT before development of bowel complication in the form of perforation. So this is the first point. Suppose there is no peritonitis and there is no bowel compromise. That means the patient's little bit is stable. No peritonitis, no bowel compromise. I should categorize the patient. Intestinal obstruction are of two types, either paralytic ileus or a dynamic, and the other type is mechanical intestinal obstruction. Each one has an approach. Suppose, I mean, I have to categorize the patient either as a mechanical cause of intestinal obstruction or as a paralytic ileus. How can I differentiate? Mechanical intestinal obstruction, the patient will present with severe abdominal pain, usually colic in nature, this is the first manifestation, followed by, followed by abdominal distension and absolute constipation and vomiting. Whereas a patient with paralytic areas usually present with the abdominal distension. It's a picture of paralysis. First he has an abdominal distension. The situation later on will have an abdominal discomfort patient will say, I have an abdominal distension, then I have an abdominal discomfort, not a pain, because there is an luminal obstruction at the mechanical time. So this luminal obstruction will cause an exaggerated movement, so it's colicky pain. But whereas in the paralytic areas, abdominal distension, abdominal discomfort followed sometimes by pain, then obstipation or absolute constipation will sometimes vomiting. This is clinical evaluation. Radiological eva or exa by examination, the patient with the paralytic areas, once they are going to do PR, has dilated rectum. That means there is no collapsed rectum or empty rectum as in the case of mechanical obstruction. Because in the mechanical obstruction, there's an obstruction for human. The distal part of the colon or the small bowel this step to the side of obstruction will be collapsed, evacuated, and there is no inflow from the proximal part. Whereas in the areas, the colon will be hugely dilated. Radiologically, the, the, uh, I can differentiate between them. In, in mechanical intestinal obstruction, the patient has, for example, in small bowel obstruction, he has a multiple air fluid level, dilated small bowel at the central part, whereas the colon is collapsed no gas in the rectum, especially in, in once the patient is presented late. Whereas in the anus, the patient has usually dilated bowels, large or small, with gas in the rectum. That means there is no there is no mechanical cause for the obstruction. The gas is going through all the part of the colon and the small bowel. Whereas in the mechanical time, the distal part to the obstruction and uh, it's collapsed. There is no gas because the gas evacuated through passing platus or stool distal to the site of obstruction. So, once I receive the patient, first, I will repeat many times, peritonitis, no, okay, 
no power compromise, first mechanical or a mechanical. If the patient has a mechanical type of intestinal obstruction, so in a mechanical types we have two causes, either paralytic areas or chronic pseudo obstruction. How can I differentiate? Chronic pseudo obstruction can be diagnosed by exclusion of the causes that may cause paralytic areas. We have many causes, maybe we will speak later on. All of you know what are the causes of paralytic areas. After I can exclude the causes of paralytic areas, I will think about chronic pseudo obstruction or what's called Olgives syndrome. Olgives syndrome usually affects old age patient with chronic diseases, especially uh, neurological disease, patient taking narcotics for a long time. Those patients are susceptible for the chronic pseudo obstruction, the ID. Paralytic areas, how can I manage? Chronic pseudo obstruction, how can I manage? Paralytic areas, after confirming what is the cause of paralytic areas, correct the cause, the patient will improve and during that we need to do proper management for the obstruction. So in a case of a dynamic intestinal obstruction, I will try to correct the underlying cause. But generally in the ER, the patient need my support. What's the idea of my support as a surgeon, as an ER doctor? First, I should keep the patient in view. It's number one, give or put nasogastric tube according to the age of the patient. Give an proper IV fluid to correct the deficit, to replace the ingoing loss, and to give the maintenance. Insert Foley's catheter. Why Foley's catheter? You should the monitor the input and the output and to determine a good balance. The urine output is a good indicator for tissue perfusion because once there is good urine output, that means there is good tissue perfusion. Sometimes we may need an antibiotic in certain situations once there is manifestation of septicemia due to bacterial transformation. We will speak later on about the pathophysiology of the intestinal obstruction. So this is the proper management. I will start with the proper management after an A, B, C that I mentioned. Then I will categorize is the patient in peritonitis or no, if peritonitis OT, bowel compromise or no, if bowel compromise OT, if there is no peritonitis or uh, I mean uh, bowel compromise, categorize the patient in a mechanical or mechanical intestinal obstruction. If the patient a mechanical intestinal obstruction, please categorize is it paralytic areas or Olgives syndrome. Why? In a paralytic areas, you should keep the patient in the follow in the previous mentioned management in the form of MBU and GTU I fluid for the scatter, uh, correction fluid and electrolyte, correct the underlying cause, the patient will improve inshallah. But regarding the Olgives syndrome or chronic zero obstruction, the patient should be the, the previous management as mentioned in BUI fluid, etc. But I should stop the narcotics. I should keep the patient with the, in, uh, with the observation. If not improved with the previous management, I, will sh I, I, I should start what's called uh, a new stigmine or anticholinergic. If not improved with the uh, new stigmine, I should start chronic or colonoscopic decompression. If not improved, surgical. So we finished the mechanical intestinal obstruction. The mechanical. I received a patient with mechanical intestinal obstruction. I exclude the mechanical and mechanical causes. Now I should categorize: is it small bowel obstruction or large bowel obstruction? In small bowel obstruction, the patient, the, the categorization on history examination and sometimes also radiologically and clinically. If it's small bowel obstruction or large bowel obstruction, the small
small bowel obstruction, usually the patient will present it clinically with the, uh, with the manifestation of intestinal obstruction. Radiologically, there is a multiple air fluid level and the colon is collapsed. There is no gas in the colon. Uh, whereas in the colonic obstruction, whatever transfer descending, we will find that there is an a gas at the level of the colon. It will be dilated. But at this step to the site obstruction, there is no gas. So, is it small bowel, small uh, bowel intestinal obstruction, or large bowel? In addition to the radiological evaluation, small bowel intestinal obstruction usually the patient will develop vomiting prior to the constipation or obstipation. Whereas in the colonic obstruction, usually the patient will start to manifest the abdominal pain and the constipation or absolute constipation before development of the vomiting because the level of obstruction is low. So I categorize, is it small or large? Generally, generally in adult. The most common cause of a small bowel obstruction, we can abbreviate it in A, B, C. A, adhesion. B, bulging hernia, C, carcinomatosis for cancer. Whereas in the colon obstruction, can abbreviate it in CDV. C is cancer, D, diverticulitis, V is a bolus. Generally, a lot of causes, but this is the most common causes. So, again, there is no peritonitis, no bowel compromise, it is not a dynamic intestinal obstruction, it is dynamic. The patient, why dynamic? The patient has quality abdominal pain, you, uh, abdominal distension, vomiting, absolute constipation. Not like the dynamic abdominal distension and uh, abdominal discomfort. And the colon, there is no gas in the rectum, by, I mean by radiology. But uh, it is small bowel or large bowel, I will try to evaluate it radiologically as I mentioned. In small bowel intestinal obstruction, please ask yourself. Did you do previous surgical intervention to the abdomen? I mean, laparotomy, appendectomy. I what, what about the, the abdominal procedure? Yes or no? Yes. This means think about adhesive intestinal obstruction. But please, don't think about adhesive intestinal obstruction without exclusion. Our cause that may without exclusion. Our causes that may cause intestinal obstruction rather than adhesion. Sometimes we are focusing on the intestinal obstruction as adhesive type of intestinal obstruction, but if I did or if I, if I discussed with the patient and I took a proper history and proper examination, sometimes there was an underlying malignancy. And because just the patient has previous surgery, I will think this is an adhesive intestinal obstruction. So, patient has previous surgery, yes or no? Yes, think about adhesive. It is a good sign that the patient has an adhesive intestinal obstruction because most of the adhesive intestinal obstruction will improve with conservative management. Five percent with the patient underwent previous abdominal surgery, they will develop intestinal obstruction. Ninety, more than ninety percent, they will improve with conservative management in the form of NGT, IV fluid, colis catheter, correction fluid, electrolyte status, and the patient will improve. If adhesive intestinal obstruction, think, is it complete or partial? Because if the patient complete intestinal obstruction, you have a chance of about 24 hours. If the patient improved, it's okay. Not improve, for what you If partial intestinal obstruction, why partial? Yes, sometimes fetus, but constipation, sometimes on, sometimes off. Sometimes I have constipation and abdominal distension, sometimes improve. This is partial intestinal obstruction. Partial intestinal obstruction, you have a chance of about 27 hours. Some orders say as the surgeon prefer, maybe longer than 72 hours, as the patient stable, no peritonitis and no, no bowel compromise. If improved, that's okay. Patient passed without surgery. If not improved, the patient may need surgical intervention. So this is for adhesive intestinal obstruction. So if the patient no peritonitis, no power compromise and it is not a dynamic and he has mechanical intestinal obstruction but he doesn't have a history of previous surgery 
so it is mechanical but non-adhesive that's me i have a cause what is the cause either intraluminal causes luminal and extraluminal causes generally after my evaluation after my station the patient need usually surgical intervention to relieve the cause of mechanical obstruction this is generally with some exceptions for certain situation for example in case of radiation iliatus in case of the patient has an abdominal abscess can be managed by percutaneous drainage in case of inflammatory bowel disease can be managed with medical management i mean there is sometimes some exceptions for this situation but generally as a rule if there is mechanical cause for intestinal obstruction the patient should be taken for OT. Previously, there is an uh, words, uh, don't let the sun to rise or to sunset for a patient with intestinal obstruction without laboratory. So this is the general ideas, the general approach. I mean the general approach. For all of these things I mentioned, there is an exception. But there is not enough time for description for this exception. But this is the general look rule for, for, for most of the patients who present in the emergency department of the OBD for a proper evaluation. In brief, A, B, C. Keep the patient in BO, in GT, IV fluid, resuscitation, correct fluid, electrolyte. Assess if there is peritonitis, bowel compromise, if present, OT. If not, Assess mechanical or amechanical. If a mechanical, confirm is it alias or all gives syndrome. Of all gives, there is a special approach. If there is paratic alias, correct the underlying cause. If there is mechanical obstruction, assess small or large bowel. If it is a small bowel, adhesive or non adhesive. If adhesive, conservative management. If not adhesive, usually surgical intervention. For the colon or large bowel obstruction, you should exclude three things. As I said, cancer, diverticulitis, and uh, us. In cancer, generally, the patient either for colonoscopic stenting for the site of obstruction and to prepare the patient for surgery if we have the facility for stenting. If not, take the patient for OT. I mean, if not, if we didn't have the facility for colonic stenting as a bridge for surgery to convert the patient from emergency to elective. If we have, this is the cancer, diverticulitis usually can be managed. We have the classification for diverticulitis, one, two, three, four. Uh, up to one, two can be managed uh, with conservative and some sort of intervention. Percutaneous training. You, it's, we need the time for description, but in diverticulitis, sometimes can be managed with conservative management. So we are not hurry for surgery. But in three or four, where is frank perforation and peritonitis? This is for according to our approach. Peritonitis is the first priority to recognize. The uh, the last thing is the valvulus. Usually we have cecal valvulus and we have sigmoid valvulus. Cecal valvulus confirm radiologically where there is a cuffy pain shaped uh, and it's uh, we can say it's a big directed toward the left hypochondria usually this is ileocecal volvulus generally ileocecal volvulus need intervention whereas in sigmoid volvulus almost the cuffy pain appearance and usually the direction up to the uh, directed toward the right uh, hypochondria in a, a colonic or sigmoid volvulus, we have a chance for colonoscopic decompression. And I will shift the condition from uh, the emergency situation to elective. If I didn't, if I, we don't have this colonic colonoscopic decompression, we, we should take the patient for OT because this is mechanical intestinal obstruction. So, this is, as I say, say this is the general uh, approach regarding the uh, situation of uh, or a clinical problem of intestinal obstruction. Uh, I hope uh, to get the benefit. Thank you.